Um, meeting. There we go. We're recording. So this will make it easier for recollection purposes. All right. So let's get right into it. Um, and let me open up the PowerPoint. And Okay, so this is kind of a version of a lecture that I give publicly as well. Um, a lot of people kind of ask for me to talk to them about global warming. And so um, I, I often give lectures that are similar to, to this one. And so y'all are gonna get the more in-depth um, version of it. So global warming, which I like to refer to climate change as global warming. I think it's um, it's more alarmist and I like that. Um, <clears throat> but obviously global warming is a lot more than just warming. So what is global warming? Um, this morning I stuck a few new figures in here. This is a uh, fresh hot off the press from the new IPCC report, the International Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, which is the United Nations um, panel that was convened, we talked about this last week, in the 1980s to study the impact that humans are having on the climate. And what this graph does is it breaks down which component, uh, which, you know, human, um, forcing is what we would call it, but um, which, you know, influence that humans are having on the climate system, how much they are contributing to the observed warming. So relative to 1850 to 1900 average, the earth has warmed just over one degree Celsius. Okay, so about 1.1 degrees Celsius. And of that one degree Celsius, um, <clears throat> the total human influence is just about the same, a little bit higher. It's being offset by slight changes in, um, you know, other human drivers that are not greenhouse gases. So if we look at the impact, for example, from well-mixed greenhouse gases, if there were nothing else going on and we were just looking at the impact on temperature from those greenhouse gases, we would expect a 1.5 degree um, see warming. Uh, we've observed about 1.1, which means that some of that is being offset by other human drivers, such as um, anthropogenic aerosols or particulates, smoke, um, basically from smokestacks, right, or your car exhaust or those sorts of things, little particulates. And the reason that those cool things down a little bit is because they kind of act like a cloud um, and they reflect some of the sun's sunlight. So they're kind of like a geoengineering technique almost. Um, although we're not talking about geoengineering, that's another class that I teach in the spring. Um, but you can see just carbon dioxide alone is contributing about 0 0.75 degrees C of warming, methane another half of degree, nitrous oxide um, slightly less, maybe 0.1, and other halogenated gases also 0.1. So these are the greenhouse gases, right? These are the well-mixed greenhouse gases. So um, what this is saying is that the vast majority, I mean, all of, basically all, um, we're never allowed to say that in science, right? We're never allowed to say 100% because as we've talked about, there's all this room for error and randomness and blah, 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 as we've been through in this course, right? So we say the, <laughs> almost all, um, just about all of the warming is due to human influence on the climate system. There are small signals from changes to solar and volcanic drivers and just internal variability. This is basically the error. Hang on, sorry, someone is coming in. Um, <clears throat> this is basically the 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 error, right? Um, on your on your midterm, there was a question, you know, what uh, what are some of the uncertainties? This is the combination of randomness and, and, and instrument error and human bias that's included in this term here. All right, so when we talk about um, climate change, oh, also um, feel free to interrupt me literally whenever. Um, you can try to cut me off uh, just by...
But if you do the little like hand raising button at the bottom, um, it'll make a sound. And so I'll stop and see um, who it is. So um, please cut me off at any time if you have a comment or a question. All right, so when we talk about climate change, I like to refer to the impacts that we've seen from this warming called, the, I call them the big five. So the big five are, number one, the increase in the global surface temperature. Obviously this is global warming, so the temperature is going up. Um, the second one is sea level rise, right? The change, the global average change in sea level, which is also increasing, right? So sea level is rising. Uh, the third one is the decline in Arctic summertime sea ice. So this is ice that is floating on the ocean, um, sea ice. Same as the, the iceberg, right, that the, that the Titanic hit, um, that's sea ice. Um, and then the, third, the fourth one is um, a change in the globally averaged upper ocean heat content. And I'll talk about that um, at the end because that's an important one, but it's often overlooked. And then the last one is uh, the change in um, snow cover and land ice. So this is um, a map showing the cumulative uh, global mass balance of all the glaciers on Earth. Um, <clears throat> you can see that, you know, since 1945, the mass of glacier ice has been decreasing very quickly. Um, so we'll get into all of these. I have sea level rise here first, but I'm actually going to skip ahead to, to temperatures, and then I'll return back to sea ice and all the other stuff. So I want to start with temperatures because whenever we talk about global warming, um, we're, we're, you know, the first thing that comes to mind, obviously it's going, it's in the word, um, global warming. So we want to talk about the fact that the earth is warming. The earth is warming. Um, this is been confirmed over and over and over and over and over again. Um, the earth has warmed, as I said in the first slide, about just over a degree Celsius since 1850. So here's another figure also hot off the press from the, from the IPCC report. On the left, you can see the temperature record for the planet um, going all the way back to the year one or the year zero. Um, <clears throat> and this has been reconstructed from ice cores and other uh, ways that we observe the climate that aren't thermometers. And what you can see is that for much of the last 2,000 years, the temperature was steady and possibly declining slightly. Um, this is because we were likely heading into another ice age. Um, ice ages are cyclical um, currently in this current regime that we're in um, or were in before we fucked it up. Um, so uh, we would we we came out of an ice age about 10 fifteen thousand years ago and we were due to head back into one you know fairly soon so we we probably were and then around 1850 of course as we talked about last week we started emitting um, all kinds of greenhouse gases and that caused a rise in the temperature of about one and a half degrees <clears throat> um, and this corresponds to uh, this corresponds to the uh, if we if we decompose this into its natural and human and natural components, we find that the actual observed temperature record corresponds really well to the model simulations of the human and natural components combined. Um, so we're very confident that the warming that we've observed is due to human activity. I think what's tricky about temperatures is that when we say the climate has warmed one degree, I think most people have no ability to conceptualize what that means. Today, the temperature is going to go up 20 degrees from morning to night. So what does one degree of global warming mean, right? That's, it's a really difficult concept, I think, to grasp. Um, because it has to do with statistics, the statistical change, the statistical change in, the, in what temperatures are, you're likely to experience, right? Um, and not just the absolute temperature rise. So what a one degree temperature, and I brought my, my whiteboard 
So I get to be like teacher, teacher energy here. Um, big teacher energy. So what a degree of warming is saying, let me just tilt this down a little bit. So what we mean by a degree of warming is actually a shift in the distribution of potential temperatures. So I'm going to make a graph here. And on the y-axis, I'm going to say that this is the likelihood of the particular temperature occurring. So this is the likelihood that a particular temperature will occur. And on this axis, this is the actual temperature that is occurring. So let's take today in Chicago. Let's say that the normal average temperature for the high is about 50 degrees. I don't know if that's True, it's probably around 50 degrees, right? Um, so that has the highest likelihood of happening today. But when I draw this graph, this graph represents all the possible temperatures that could occur today based on the climate. So while it's the most likely that it will be what the normal temperature is supposed to be, right, is supposed, supposed to be, it's still possible, it's still very likely that it could be, for example, 40 or it could be 60. Those are still relatively likely things that could occur. It becomes less likely that it's like, you know, 10 degrees today, much less likely that it's 80 degrees, for example, but the likelihood decreases around the normal, but there's still a statistical distribution. It could still be anywhere from whatever the record low is for today to whatever the record high is, right? What climate change, and so let's say that, you know, based on this information, these temperatures over here are what we might call hot, hot for today, okay? And I'll shade those in red. So that would be like a hot temperature for today, an unusually hot temperature. And then these temperatures down here are maybe what we would consider unusually cold for this day. Okay, based on this statistical distribution, these are all the possible temperatures, but if it's in this range, we would probably consider it to be hot. Now, climate change has warmed everything by one degree. So let's take this normal and let's move it one degree warmer. That shifts the entire distribution, okay, over here. So while it is still possible, right, so now I'll, I'll, I'll do like, I'll make this one dash so we have reference point. Um, but what this is saying is that the new climate, okay, which is the solid line now, this is the warmed climate, it can still be cold, right? It can, there are still parts of this curve that are over here. Okay, it can still be cold. However, the part under this curve that's what we would formerly have considered cold has decreased. So there's less likelihood of it being cold. But the part under this curve that exists where we would have formerly said that it was hot out, okay, has increased. So now the likelihood that the temperature today is hotter than normal is, is, is much higher. Even though the temperature has only gone up one degree, the likelihood, the area under the curve of what we formerly would have considered hot has increased significantly because the whole distribution has shifted. Yeah, Melon, go ahead. Sorry to interrupt, but um, okay. I've, I'm not quite sure if I missed this, if you already said, but um, how long does it do, have we figured out how long it takes to kind of uh, have a one degree shift? Like, or is it just so determined, like, is it so reliant on like human behavior that is changing that we just don't know yet? Right, so we've already observed one degree. Um, that's what we've actually physically observed like in the data. And that took about 150 years or so. 
Um, but it's probably accelerating. So the next degree could take only 30 years. Um, and the next degree after that could so we have estimates for that. And I, I'll get to that um, when we talk, when we get to the, like what we project for the future. But yeah, it's a good question because our, you know, um, the rate at which the, we're warming by one degree is dependent on how much greenhouse gases we put into the atmosphere, right? So it's, it's increasing. We're doing way more now than we were doing in 1850. So the temperature rise is accelerating. So it's warmed a degree in 100 years, and it might warm the next degree in 30 years. Does that make sense? Okay, thank you. Sorry for interrupting. Yeah. No, no, it's okay. Um, so yeah, so the, so, the, so the idea is that that degree, right, that degree right here has shifted the whole distribution. So even though it's only a degree, it's actually quite significant because it's increased the likelihood that it could be warmer by a significant amount, actually, right? It's not a one-to-one -one thing. It increases the likelihood. You can see how much it's increased the likelihood just on this graph alone, right? The red area is now much bigger than the blue, whereas before they were kind of even. So this is what's happening with climate change. This is also called shifting baseline. So now we might actually move this line over and say, no, actually now we would consider it warm if it's over here actually, right? So all these temperatures that a hundred years ago we thought were really warm for today are now just closer to normal. So we shift the baseline with it, we shift our expectations. Um, and so it's hard for us to necessarily perceive what one degree of warming actually means. Because that's kind of a weird thing, right? What does one degree of warming actually mean? Um, it's complicated. And so that's what this shift in distribution means. So here's a an idealized picture of that, uh, what I just drew. I think my drawing personally was better. Um, but what you can see is that the likelihood of record heat increases and the likelihood of record cold decreases. This becomes evident if you look at just the temperature record, uh, the weather stations, um, and the temperature records at the weather stations in the United States, every single day, there are, there are thousands of weather stations now um, in the US and every single day for every one record low, there are three record highs that are set. And so this is evidence of the shift in the distribution. We can also look straight at the data. Um, this figure on the left here is showing the percentage of land area in the summer, June, July, and August in the Northern Hemisphere that would be considered hot, very hot, or extremely hot. And you can see that in 1900, maybe 30% of the land area would be considered hot, but by 2015, it's 80%. This is the shift in the distribution. This is the actual distribution shifting. So while it's one degree of warming, the percentage of land area that's considered hot went up 50%, okay? So it's a significant change due to just one degree. So when we say, oh my God, it's one degree, climate deniers are always like, one degree, that's nothing. That's like, whatever. But actually it's quite significant because of the shift in the distribution. Does this make sense to everyone? Okay, good. Because that's the most important part about all of this actually is like, understanding that 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 the shift in the just in the distribution is actually what we're after and not just that hard that like physical change in temperatures this is also a failure i think of science communication scientists know what we mean by this we don't we don't explain this to scientists all the time but when the new york times publishes something and it's like two degrees of warming and then it's on the front page and everyone's like two degrees is nothing the temperature went up 30 degrees today right it gets confusing um, here's just like one final graph showing the actual shift in the distribution. So um, James Hansen, who we talked about last week, um, did a study where he looked at the distribution of temperatures um, globally for June, July, and August, and then also for the Northern Hemisphere land masses. And you can see that for each decade, the, the distribution curve is shifting to warmer temperatures, right? So you can see that the 1950 curve, the red one here, and then the 2001 to 2011 curve is over here. It's definitely shifted. Um, everything here has been normalized to zero to make it easy, right? Um, but this would be a temperature on the bottom if you were like in a specific location. Okay, 
So that's temperatures. Um, if we have no more questions on that, I'm going to assume that we all are good. And I'm going to backtrack to, to go to sea level rise. Okay. So the increase in temperatures, that's a really important concept for understanding everything about climate change. Because ultimately, climate change is a science of statistics. Um, as we, you know, look at, for example, the difference between weather and climate, climate is what you expect to happen, weather is what happens. So climate is basically the average, the statistical average weather for a particular region. So, um, you know, when people, climate science is, climate scientists isn't really like a, necessarily a discipline in a lot of schools. Um, so when people ask me what I am, I actually sometimes say that I'm a statistician because I do so much statistics, so many statistics. That's all, a lot of climate is statistics. And another one of those statistics that we'll talk about that's also difficult to visualize is sea level rise. So backing out, if we look at the global mean sea level change, we can see that it's obviously going up. Sea level is obviously rising. We know this through looking at just tide gauge buoys. And then since 1993, we've had satellite radar altimetry, which can measure sea level from space. And what we found is that since 1900, sea level has risen about 200 millimeters or so, um, which if I do the math, 200 millimeters, and there are how many millimeters per inch? 25.4. So that's about 7.9 inches, about eight inches of sea level rise since uh, 1900. Okay, eight inches of sea level rise sounds like literally nothing. If you've been to the ocean, the ocean's huge, eight inches is like this much, right? So again, this is a situation just like with temperature where a one degree rise in temperature doesn't mean much until you think of the shift in the distribution. It's the same with sea level. Uh, uh, an eight inch rise in sea level seems like nothing until you think about what that actually means. Before we get there though, <clears throat> um, the rate at which the sea level is rising is accelerating from about 0 0.6 millimeters per year in 1900 to about 3.1 millimeters per year in by 2017, which is when this graph ends. Um, it's about, it's probably about the same, although it might be increasing a little bit since then. Can someone tell me what the two main reasons, specific reasons, for why the sea level rise, why the sea level is rising. What are those two specific reasons? They're also on the next slide. If you have really good eyesight, you can maybe potentially see it. Uh, yeah, B and then Lily. Um, the ice caps are, are melting. Yep, good, the ice caps are melting. And then Lily, is that what you were gonna say? Okay, so that is the one, that's the one, the ice caps are melting. Um, that's like the one that everyone always says. Um, what does anyone know the other one? The other one is tricky. So the other one is called thermal expansion. Basically, as water gets warmer, it takes up more room. It takes up more space. Warmer water takes up more space. So as the oceans get warmer, they take up more space. And since they're confined on the sides and the bottom by the continents and the seafloor, the only way they can go is up. So prior to, you know, 1993 or so, these were about 50-50, about 50% 50 from thermal expansion, about 50% from melting ice sheets. It's now leaning more heavily towards the ice sheet side of the equation because the ice sheets and glaciers are melting much faster than we anticipated, actually. Um, so, this is a push and pull between these two things, but these two factors are both contributing um, to sea level rise. And as I mentioned, the rate of the rise is increasing to over three millimeters per year. Since 1993, this is equated, uh, equals about four inches of sea level rise just in the last, you know, 30 years. And this is the fastest rate since the glaciers were melting at the end of, at the end of the last ice age, basically. So um, we are increasing uh sea level um at a at a very scary rate right now 
And this last point, every vertical inch equals 50 to 100 inches inland. I'm going to expand on that in a moment because that's really the key um, point. But before we get to that, there is this cool web app, um, which you can Google. Let me, I never remember the exact um, URL, but it's, if you Google like surging seas, um, yeah, it's like sea level dot climate central dot org. Um, and actually, why don't I share my screen for a second? So uh, feel free to play around on your computer also while I'm doing this because um, it's a really fun little web app. So um, here is, it's coming. So here is the URL. Um, where is it? Where's on my screen? Uh, so it's sea level.climatecentral.org. And if you click on um, where is it? mapping choices, and then you can do split map, which is really cool. Uh, and you can play around with different. Um, if it ever comes up, <laughs> you can play around with different, oh my God, oh, now everything's got ads, um, different locations and then different levels of warming. So let's say that we want to, where, where should we go? Let's go to anyone. I'm going to go to New Orleans then, if no one has a specific place that they'd like to see. Because um, New Orleans is obviously one of the more extreme. So on the left, let's choose like the, the um, yeah, three degrees of C, three degrees C of warming, which is like um, kind of the middle of the road. That's what we actually expect to happen. And then historic carbon pollution, which is basically everything up to and including today, everything that we've emitted. So let's see if it ever comes up. <laughs> but what's cool about it is that you can compare the two. Oh my God. Well, it looks like the app is really slow or my computer is really slow today, but um, feel free to play around with it. And you can kind of compare different geographical locations and, um, and other things. I don't know if it's ever gonna come up. Maybe not. It hates me. Hopefully it's working on y'all's computers. <laughs> um, okay, well, I'm gonna give up on this because it seems to be not really working, but I do have some, some screenshots, but feel free to play around um, with it while I'm talking, that's okay. Um, it's a very cool thing. So I've got um, a couple images here which compare just kind of uh, generic situations where you've got the historic park carbon pollution and the unchecked pollution for South Florida, for example, and then um, also for London. So for South Florida, for example, right, even if we emit no more carbon dioxide, no more greenhouse gases, sea level is still going to rise another eight inches to a foot. Um, and that's because the momentum and the inertia in the ocean water is slow. The ocean warms up slowly, glaciers melt slowly. So even if we stopped emitting carbon dioxide, um, it, it still might, uh, might not. Sorry, I'm just reading the comments. No, it, I might be breaking up a lot. Sometimes my Wi-Fi is terrible. Um, are people having problems hearing me? Okay, let me, let me like try closing a, a, more tabs or something. I don't know. It's my Wi-Fi in this house is like terrible and I don't know why they charge so fucking much for such shitty fucking Wi-Fi. Also, just to vent for a second, for those who can hear me, who I'm not breaking up for, <laughs> um, the school, I feel like the school put all my classes, put all of the academic classes virtual to save money. 
um, because there's not enough physical space. They let the lease expire on one of the buildings. Um, and of course, that ultimately, because of capitalism, that cost gets transferred onto all of us because we all have to have Wi-Fi that fucking works well and that can run a lot, right? So I'm just, I'm real, it's irritating um, to say the least. Is it better now or still bad? Okay, great. It might have been that site, honestly. That site seemed to be really. Um, so, okay, so comparing these two, right? The main point I was trying to make here is that, um, yeah, definitely the struggle. And it's been like <laughs> two years for me. I haven't taught an in-person class since March 13th, 2020. Horrible. I can't wait actually to be in person in January. I'm like, have to go all the way back downtown in the dead of winter. And I'm really fucking excited about it. Um, anyway, so for those of you that are still around, I would love to see you all um, when that happens. Anyway, the point I was making was even if we stopped emitting carbon dioxide, the sea level is going to continue rising because of this delayed inertia, um, which really sucks for for all of us um, because there's nothing we can really do about um, about it. We've already done it. The damage is done. Um, so London, which is not a place that you would expect to necessarily be below sea level or elected or affected by sea level rise is on a river that empties out into the sea. And so sea level rise will affect parts of, you know, South London, um, Battersea, etc. So um, even places that you might not expect it are going to experience sea level rise. Bangladesh is another place uh, that is ex going to experience um, really damaging sea level rise in the next um, century or so. And just a one meter sea level rise, okay, so three feet, which is what we expect to happen from everything that we're doing, would flood about 20% of the land area in Bangladesh and displace almost 15 million people. Globally, this would equate to about 200 million people that would be displaced um, or would require some form of a seawall. So this sea level rise is going to cause a lot of problems actually. Um, for example, some island nations will be completely wiped off the map by one meter of sea level rise and already eight low-lying Pacific islands have gone underwater, have been swallowed by rising seas. One of the poster children for sea level rise is the country of Tuvalu, and that's because they had the, um, the confidence to stand up to the United States and George Bush specifically during the Kyoto Protocol. Um, perhaps I'm dating myself here, but I remember this kind of viscerally as a seminal moment in my own um, feelings about climate change and my own um, approach to environmental issues. And they actually said to, to the US by refusing to ratify the Kyoto Protocol, which was kind of the, the original, original, original COP26 um, agreement to reduce greenhouse gases, um, pre-Paris Agreement, pre-COP26, um, the U.S. has effectively denied future generations of Tuvaluans their fundamental freedom to live where our ancestors have lived for thousands of years. Um, so sea level rise is affecting nations, um, low-lying Pacific islands, et cetera, et cetera. But I wanted to, again, return to my, to my drawing, um, my whiteboard. Also, can you see me? at all everyone or no yes okay cool you can hear me you can see me everything's good i even wore a nice sweater for you all so i hope you can see me um i decided to put cl real clothes on today and not just my pajamas um pretty amazing pretty amazing stuff um all right so the the real thing with sea level rise that's similar to temperature rise is let's take a city that's on the coast. All right, so here's um, the city up here. Look at that city, huh? Yeah, that's a cool city. Um, so here's a city on the, on the shore. And let's say that the sea level is currently right here. 
So this is all like the beach or what we would call in um, climate science or in ecological sciences, the floodplain. That means that this is here because when there's a bad storm, um, when there's a very high tide, right? This can flood and it's nature intended it that way so that it can flood. So as it, when it floods, okay, let's say there's like a, a bad flood. And so now the sea will flood part of the beach, right? So the sea level temporarily will rise. Let's say there's a bad hurricane or something. Sea level will temporarily rise. Okay, now let's say that with sea level rise, sea level has now gone up three feet. So the new sea level is here. Okay, this city is still above sea level. Okay, but now let's say there's a really bad storm. Okay, there's a really bad storm and the storm surge is like another three feet or something, right? All of a sudden, that storm is flooding the city. So the floodplain, right, has shifted closer and closer to the city. So even if this city temporarily escapes sea level rise, it might not escape a bad flood from a bad storm or a bad sea, um, a bad high tide. And so this is actually the real danger with sea level rise is that places like, uh, you know, Miami, New Orleans, they can build seawalls, they can try to fortify everything, but you get a bad storm, right? You get something that happens, you breach the levees, like what happened in New Orleans during Katrina, right? All of this stuff is why the higher that the sea level is, the more likely it is that a bad storm will flood areas further and further inland. So this is the real danger with sea level rise is the impact it has on bad storms and high tides. Miami already experiences random flooding of its downtown every year, actually multiple times a year because of um, uh, what they're called, what they call king tides when you have a really high tide and because sea level has risen, that high tide um, is now starting to flood Miami regularly. Um, and not even a hurricane, just a normal high tide, right? And it will flood the downtown area. So this is the real danger, I think, um, from sea level rise. Okay, any question, any more, any questions so far? All right, then let's move on to Arctic sea ice. Arctic sea ice is um, most commonly associated with the really iconic charismatic megafauna, the polar bear, right? Polar bears need Arctic sea ice to hunt. But more importantly, just looking at this picture, what color is the ice? White. Anyone? Yes. White, correct, good. Um, and then what color is the ocean? ish black yes dark black so when we're thinking about the sun okay the sun reflects off of white things and is absorbed by dark black things so as the arctic sea ice melts and exposes more and more of this dark black dark blue ocean then we can the earth has the ability to absorb more and more of that sun's light so actually the reflectivity of the planet has decreased. So the planet now reflects slightly less sunlight. And this is contributing to climate change in a way that's independent from the greenhouse gases. So the greenhouse gases caused the warming, which caused the ice to melt in the first place. But now that the ice is melting, it's causing a feedback. We call this a feedback loop, which means that Carbon dioxide causes the temperature to warm. The warmer temperature melts the ice. The melted ice exposes the dark surface. The dark surface absorbs more sunlight. And that means that the temperature can go up again and melt more ice just from the ice melting. So it, it's a multiplier. It multiplies the effect of greenhouse gases. This is why we're so concerned about melting Arctic sea ice because it's accelerating the rate of climate change. It's adding to the effect of the greenhouse gases. 
okay? It's adding to it. So it's very dangerous because um, it could produce this kind of runaway feedback effect um, where you get a warmer and warmer planet and, um, and that in turn causes more ice to melt, which causes it to get warmer, blah, 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 right? It can't, it's like a, it's like a steamrolling effect. It's a feedback loop. So this is the real kind of concern with, with Arctic sea ice. And this graph, oh, I just love this graph um, because I think it just summarizes everything so well. So what this is showing is by month, the volume of Arctic sea ice for every year that we've had a satellite observing it. So from 1979 through 2021, I literally just pulled this figure an hour ago from my friend who studies this stuff. Um, he has a really cool website and makes these really aesthetic figures. Um, and what you can see, it's so clear, clear as day. So every year, the Arctic sea ice experiences a cycle. It increases as it gets colder and colder in the winter. And then as soon as the sun comes back to the Arctic, right, because it's dark in the Arctic Ocean in the winter, but then the sun comes back in the spring and the ice melts, it reaches a low point sometime in September, and then it starts growing again. This is a normal cycle. But you can see that for every year, the dark blue is the 1980s and the red color is the 2010s, 2020s. You can see that every year the cycle shifts lower and lower. So not only do we have lower ice in the summer, but we're building back less ice in the winter. And you can see that 2021 here was very close to the record low amount of Arctic sea ice. The record low actually occurred in 2012. 2020 was the second lowest and 2021 is somewhere up here, but you can see how even since 2003, the, the low, the minimum, the summertime minimum is shifting lower and lower. That's this part here, it's shifting down from 1979 through the 2000s, which are in white, through the 2010s, through now, right? It's very obvious, I think it's really clear. I love these figures because they do such a good job showing them. Here's another one. You can see that as the annual amount of Arctic sea ice declines, the temperature in the Arctic is increasing. Something else you'll notice is that just since 1960 alone, the temperature in the Arctic has gone up three degrees Celsius. So globally, the global average temperature has gone up one degree Celsius, but in the Arctic, it has gone up three degrees Celsius. That is because of this feedback effect which we call the ice albedo feedback. I'll actually type that into the, into the chat. Ice albedo feedback. Um, yeah, oh, sorry, Lily, I just saw your question. Um, I'll respond to that really quick. So it is, Chicago is experiencing damaging lake level rise due to global warming, but it's not sea level rise because we are about 600 feet above sea level. So the lake level rise is, strictly due to extreme changes in um, precipitation and temperature. Um, so as, right, you'll probably, you probably noticed that this year has been very dry, um, much drier than normal. And so the lake level has gone down. The years before this were very wet. And so that's why we had record lake levels. Um, so that's related to precipitation. That's extreme events, which we'll talk a little bit more about next time, actually. Um, Does that not have to do with global warming then? It does. It does. Okay. Yeah. It does have to do with global warming, but not sea level rise. I didn't know if you were linking it to sea level rise or not. It definitely has to do with global warming for sure. Yeah, absolutely. Um, extremes in temperature, right? Drought followed by flood, drought by, followed by flood. That's our, that's our future. Um, so, so yeah, so as Arctic sea ice is declining, Arctic temperatures are increasing three times faster than the global average due to the ice albedo feedback. The ice albedo feedback is the thing I was talking about. As the ice melts, the dark ocean is exposed. That dark ocean absorbs more sunlight, causes the temperature to increase more. So this is, um, we're, we're, we're observing it in real time. I showed this figure, oops. Um, unfortunately, as I mentioned uh, in the first one, in the first part of the ice albedo or in the ice, <laughs> Arctic ice uh, section, this doesn't just limit it to the summer minimum. The winter time Arctic sea ice is not growing back as thick or as extensive as it used to be. Um, 
And so the, this is starting to affect even wintertime temperatures in the Arctic, uh, which you can see based on this figure here, which shows the daily high Arctic temperature. So this would be like the afternoon high temperature in the Arctic. Um, the white line is the average from, I believe it says 1958 to 2002. And the red line is this year's actual recorded temperatures. So you can see that the winter, right, and the, the early spring, although I would call this winter in the Arctic still, winter goes until about April probably, um, the winter is much warmer than it used to be, much warmer. The summer is, uh, over, but the hallmark of the summer Arctic temperature is that it's starting a little bit earlier. Um, but the warmer winters are now showing up in the record. So here, this is from Uchiavik, or what we used to call Barrow, um, Uchiavik, Alaska, which is the northernmost town in the United States. And you can see that at the airport, the temperature since the year 2000 has increased on average about 15 degrees Fahrenheit. So that's about, if we divide by two, it's about seven degrees Celsius. So the winter temperature increase is seven times more than the global average in the Arctic. So you can see how this is becoming an enormous problem, right? Um, and and, 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 and uh, the record low Arctic sea ice uh, year for the winter was actually 2018, 2017, 2018. Um, 2021 was a little bit higher, but you can see how we're all kind of in the same ballpark here. Um, and it was during this year that the Bering Sea for a period of time in the late winter had like, or sorry, in the late summer had like no ice in 2017, 2018. You can see it's virtually no ice. So this is extraordinarily low um, and very unusual for, um, for that region, for the Bering Sea. Finally, the final point I want to make about the Arctic sea ice is that it's decreasing, it's melting faster than we even anticipated. So this graph, it looks confusing, but it's not actually that confusing. The black line here is what we expect to happen to Arctic sea ice based on everything we know about the climate. This is what we call the ensemble mean of all the climate models. So what this is saying is that in 1900, Arctic sea ice extent was about 88.5 million square kilometers. So this is 10 to the six, which is a million. So 8.5 million square kilometers. And it was projected to be about 2 million square kilometers by 2100. In the year 2010 or so, it was projected to have dropped to about 7 million kilometers, but in reality, it actually dropped below 6 million kilometers, 6 million square kilometers. So sea ice is decreasing. That's what this, this red line is, the actual observed amount of sea ice, decreasing much faster than the models said it should be. So we are actually are heading towards an ice-free summer in the Arctic, potentially by the year 2050, which means that in the year 2050, in just 25 years from now or so, we could have no ice in the Arctic Ocean in the summer. No ice. That's, I mean, unprecedented, right? We don't, <laughs> we don't have an analog for that. Um, that hasn't happened in millions of years. Um, so that's really scary. Um, and I think what's really scary to me is that even climate scientists who study this as their life's work haven't fully grasped the, the rate at which the ice is melting. It's melting so fast that we almost can't explain why. Um, it's, it's worse than we thought. Um, so <laughs> sorry to be so dour. This, the, it's, I'll try to be a little bit more happy from here on out, but this is a sad, um, it is a little bit sad. Um, the fourth thing that I wanted to talk about was the decline in snow and ice cover, especially in the Northern Hemisphere. Um, the reason I talk about the Northern Hemisphere, especially is because that's where most of the land is. So we're talking about land, snow and ice now. Um, an important note, important thing to note is that sea ice, when it melts, it does not contribute to sea level rise. 
It does not contribute to sea level rise because it's already in the sea. It's already sea ice. So if you have ice in a glass, as the ice melts, it doesn't add water to the glass. Or I guess it adds liquid water, but it doesn't add a volume, right? That doesn't make the sea level go up. It doesn't make the water level in your glass go up when the ice melts. In fact, it actually probably goes down a little bit um, because ice like takes up space. So this is referring to the snow and the ice that's on the land. So when the snow and the ice that's on the land melts, it eventually finds its way to the ocean, then where it contributes to sea level rise. And the best way that actually we can look at the change in land ice is to just compare pictures, actually. Um, so we compare pictures of glaciers, for example, that we took in 1890 to now, to 2005 or now-ish, right? And you can see that here's the glacier. It's coming through the mountains here. It's coming down through this valley, and then it's emptying out into this lake. So this is an ice iceberg that's broken off from the glacier. Here it is now. You can see it's still coming down the mountain, but the ice doesn't even make it to this lake. The ice stops way up the mountain now. So it's very obvious in pictures that this glacier has melted. We don't need any other data, although we have lots of other data. You don't need any other data to say this glacier has melted. Um, you can do it with lots of different glaciers. Here's Shepherd Glacier from 1913 to 2005. You can see that the glacier is all but gone. And this isn't a thing where it melts in the summer and, and comes back in the winter. That is true, but glaciers are permanent ice. Glaciers are always there, even in the summer. They melt a little, but they shouldn't melt all the way. Um, even Mount Kilimanjaro, um, pretty infamous for having a tropical uh, latitude glacier at, at its peak, um, is, is all but snow free at the top at this point. Um, so you can see that from 1912 to 2002, the total area of ice declined basically to zero. We're basically at zero now. Um, and here are a few more images. Uh, this one is, is crazy to me. So this is a glacier coming down here, emptying out into this lake. By 2005, just 75 years later, the lake not only doesn't exist anymore because the glacier has receded so far up, but it has turned into a swampy meadow. Um, here's another one. You can see the glacier terminating here in the middle of this lake. And then in 2004, you can see that the glacier has receded and you can actually see where the old glacier, where it used to end based on the signature in the dirt and the, and the rocks. You can see right here very clearly where the glacier used to end. Um, so it receded so quickly that it's like we can see it, right? Normally this probably wouldn't happen so distinctly like this. Um, and there's a video here, which I normally show, but I'll post the link to, if you wanna watch it, it's pretty sad, but it's about Glacier National Park um, and how Glacier National Park is not gonna have any glaciers in like 20 years. Um, so go to Glacier National Park now, I guess if you wanna see glaciers in the, in the lower 48 states. Um, and then finally, our two biggest ice sheets, our two biggest glaciers, if you want to think of them like that, but they take up whole continents, are on Greenland and on Antarctica, right? Both are covered completely with ice. That ice is moving, um, but instead of calling it a glacier, we call it an ice sheet. Um, you can think of them as basically the same thing, but they are also both losing mass, losing ice really quickly. So Greenland is decreasing at 280 gigatons of ice per year. Uh, gigatons is a million tons, right? And then Antarctica is losing 118 million tons of gigatons per year. Um, and Greenland especially is accelerating. So the rate at which Greenland is melting is also increasing. Um, and these are, of course, both contributing to sea level rise. Finally, every glacier in North America is losing mass. Every single glacier that we measure is losing mass between just 1984 and now. So this is also alarming. Um, glaciers are losing um, virtually, you know, a lot of ice um, over a very short period of time. All right, finally, I know I'm, I'm over 10, but because I'm giving the lecture in person, I'm just gonna keep going here. Um, so the final thing that I want to touch on is global ocean heat content. 
this plays into all of these other things because we don't talk too much about it, but it's actually a huge player in climate change. So water has a very high heat capacity. It can hold a lot of heat without necessarily changing its temperature. So things that have like low heat capacity, right, are metals, which heat up really quickly. Um, they heat up really quickly because they just can't really hold heat. Their temperature has to respond to the input of heat into that material. But water can hold a lot of heat without necessarily getting hot. So the oceans are actually absorbing a ton of global warming. They're absorbing a ton of the warming that's occurring. In fact, if you break it out into where the heat is going, whether it's going into the ocean or it's going into land, atmosphere, and ice, you can see that over 90% of the excess heat from global warming is going into the oceans, where it is contributing to the heat content of the oceans. Now, one of the dangers, and you can see that the heat content, the amount of heat that the oceans hold is increasing just like everything else, right? Um, going up and up and up and probably accelerating. But the key number is 90%, 90% of the excess heat is going into the ocean. So if we didn't have the oceans, we wouldn't be here, but also climate change would be much worse. So the oceans are absorbing all the heat. Now the fear is that eventually the oceans won't be able to, to hold as much heat and as much carbon dioxide. Um, and if that happens, right, then just like all of these other things, you end up with this feedback, right? You end up with this um, runaway effect where global warming ends up being a lot worse. But for now, you know, most of that heat, 90% of that heat is being absorbed by the oceans. And the vast majority of it actually is going into the Southern Ocean. The Southern Ocean is the ocean that circumnavigates Antarctica. So a lot of heat is actually going into that particular ocean um, for a lot of complicated meteorological reasons. But, um, you know, that is changing the balance of heat distribution across the planet in a way that um, leads to a lot of uncertainty for our forecasts about what will happen with climate change. So those are the five things. Those are the main five things that um, climate change is doing, that the five impacts that climate change is having on our Earth system. The temperature is increasing, sea level is increasing, Arctic sea ice is melting, land ice is melting, and the heat content of the ocean is increasing significantly. So I'm going to stop the, the presentation there. Um, and if anybody has any questions, um, feel free to ask them now, or if they come to you later, feel free to ask them to me in the Discord or ask each other, um, either way. Does anyone have any questions for me right now? I know it's kind of a sad lecture, but, um, such is climate change. Um, all right, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna put a pin in it there. We return for one more week to climate change next week, and uh, we'll wrap up this section. Um, and yeah, I think we're, we're all caught up with everything. So I will see you all next week. Bye, guys. Thank you. See ya. Thank you.